If you paid attention to the reading of the psalm I told you about this week, Psalm 111, then one thing obvious emerges, that it is a celebration of the works of God. It moves, if you notice, from God's works to God's commandments that are given in His Word, which is also a work of God worthy of praise. As Christians, we believe this Bible is given to us by inspiration of God. Though men wrote it, they were moved by God to do so, so that in the final analysis, it's a product of His hands. Now, it's interesting that this psalm matches the theme of Psalm 19, which I'd ask you to turn there briefly, because this psalm sets forth the revelation of God, where God reveals himself, shows himself, unveils himself, lets himself be known, first in the creation in which we live, and also in this book, the Holy Scriptures, so that you have two sources of the revelation of God, both in the world we live in and in the book we read called the Holy Bible. Just notice the transition of thought. I'm not going to expound it in detail. I just want you to see that this points us to the two sources whereby we come to know and understand God. The heavens, there's your sky up there, declare the glory of God, and the firmament, that would be the expanse of the heavens, showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Those heavens out there are proclaiming that God is there. They're preaching a message every day. But sadly, so many people do not hear it. And it doesn't matter where it is in the world or what language is spoken. They all are making the same declaration. I've had the privilege in my life to travel to different countries and have been able to behold the same skies, same sun, same moon, same stars that you behold here. So there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth. It's interesting that the communication of the heavens and the earth is spoken of as a line going out. But think of it like this. Uh, it's different now with this modern technology, but it used to be you had phone lines, telegraph lines, in which communications were sent through the lines. And so it's describing the communication of the heavens and the earth that way, that the line of communication circ circles around this globe so that there's nowhere on this earth that what they are proclaiming is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he hath set a tabernacle for the sun. It's like those heavens are a house where the sun dwells, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It's, it's an interesting way of describing a sunrise, like a bridegroom waking up and coming out of his chamber. So the sun every morning comes out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run his race. I race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit under the ends of it. I mean, he, he goes across the sky from one end to the other. And there's nothing hid from the heat thereof. But then notice the thought switches. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is simple, sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoice in the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And so he moves in this psalm from the declaration that is made in the heavens throughout the earth to this book called the Law, the Statutes, the Testimonies, and the Commandments. So that we have two sources whereby God discovers himself to us, whereby we can come to know him. And that's by looking at the world we live in and what it's telling us and looking in the book God has given us and what it tells us. And you need both to have the best and most perfect understanding of God that is humanly possible. Now, it is interesting when we go back to Psalm 11, we're talking about the works of the Lord, but we end on the note of describing the man 
that fears God and keeps his commandments. And of course, this, as we know, is the whole duty of man. We preached a series on Ecclesiastes and we noted that Solomon's reasonings concluded on this note. In Ecclesiastes 12, 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, which is what you're doing right now in this place, worshiping Him. This is an expression of fearing Him. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And might I add, it is the duty of man and that man himself is a work of God, a product of his creative genius. You can see this in Psalm 139, 14. Now, I'm citing verses to prove this, but this would not be a very convincing argument to someone that knows nothing about the Bible and certainly has never learned to believe that it is a communication from God. In order to bring a person to that point, you're going to have to have another starting point. So as I go through this psalm, there is a message here for those of you that are believers in God and in the Bible, and a message to people that don't know that yet, are not convinced of that yet. And so we kind of weave in and out to what is uh, addressed specifically to a Bible believer and yet we're given information here that we can use to reason with those who have not come to that conviction or belief yet. And, and so uh, in Psalm 139, 14, the psalmist speaking of himself says, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. Your body is a creation of God. And the more men study the human body, and the more they study the functions of the human body, the more they realize what a miraculous, marvelous, wonderful machine that it is. As you know, I recently had open heart surgery, and I went to cardiac rehab. And in connection with the physical exercises to rehabilitate me, I took classes and they were very interesting. All of the instructors were excellent speakers. They knew their stuff. There was one young man that presented a lecture. It was so good and he presented it with such eloquence that I told him later, I said, you would make a great university professor or if your views agree with mine, a good politician. They thought that was funny. But at any rate, I remember this one class where they had this uh, model of a heart and they could take it apart and they could show you the inner chambers. And she went through the workings of the human heart. And I stopped the instructor at one point, amazed at the design, the way this thing was made to work to keep you and me alive. For those of you that are adults, that thing is beating 70 times a minute, pumping vital life blood to every part of your body. It is absolutely central to your survival. Central. And this is why when we think of things, when we think of the centrality of things, we say it's the heart of the matter. Because, I mean, that's where it's all coming from. And as she described the function of the heart, I stopped and said, how could anybody believe that this is some accident of cosmic evolution? I said, this thing begs a designer, a maker, to which she said, I agree, smart girl. So anyway, you need look no further than your own human body to find a work of God that should cause you to step back and admire one so powerful and one so wise to be able to devise something like that. Now, the, now the man that, keeps, that fears God and keeps his commandments, as we're told there in verse 10, is the man that truly praises God. Because notice the psalm opens up with a call, Praise ye the Lord. And the man that truly answers that call is the one that fears God and keeps His commandments. G. Campbell Morgan had this to say, When the light of the life harmonizes with the language of the lips, then God is worthily praised.
For God to truly and worthily be praised, it takes more than you moving your lips in a church service as we say a prayer, read a psalm, or sing a song. It takes the manner of life, the keeping of the commandments, matched with the act of worship, to truly answer the call, praise ye the Lord. The famous Baptist preacher in England, Charles Spurgeon, had this to say about the 111th Psalm. I thought it an excellent introduction. He said, the sweet singer, he's talking about the psalmist, because mind these psalms can be sung. They are chanted in Jewish synagogues by cantors. They are capable of being sung. The sweet singer dwells upon the one idea that God should be known by his people and that the knowledge when turned into practical piety, that is obedience, a good life, is man's true wisdom and the certain cause of lasting adoration. Many are ignorant of what their Creator has done, and hence they are foolish in heart and silent as to the praises of God. How many people there are that we brush by day in and day out that never acknowledge God for anything. Never a recognition of what He has done. Never a prayer of thanks. Never asking Him for anything or for His help. As to the praises of God, they are silent. This evil, and if, and if it is a duty of men to worship their Creator, to honor and serve their Creator. If indeed and in fact that is their duty, and it is, and I shall reason you to that point in this psalm, then to fail to do so is evil by definition. This evil can only be removed by a remembrance of God's works, which this psalm talks about, and a diligent study of them. To this, therefore, the psalm is meant to arouse us. It is meant to arouse us to remember God's works, to think about them, to study them. To this, therefore, the psalm is meant to arouse us. It may be called, and Mr. Spurgeon put these words all in capitals, the psalm of God's works. I couldn't agree more. It may be called the psalm of God's works intended to excite us to the work of praise. Now, I'm going to give you a few scriptures here that show you that the reason for worshiping God is because of His works, because of what God has done. Now, again, to somebody that is unfamiliar with the Bible, doesn't even really know what it's about, never talks about it, never hears about it, except maybe only in passing as some religious book that a lot of people believe, I realize that just citing these verses is not going to be a convincing argument. But once they begin to start to think about the works, the world they live in, and are able to conclude from that that God is and that God is great, then just from that conclusion alone, it logically follows that a smart person would acknowledge that greatness. A smart person would acknowledge a dependence on that greatness. A smart person would want to know, what is that God that made me require of me? Because he obviously is the one to define my reason for being. But anyway, let me just show you how the Bible points to the works of God as foundational to our worship and the reason that we do. And if you paid attention to the songs we sang this morning, they were designed to point to that fact. All thy works, we sang, shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Let not the wonders he hath wrought be lost in silence and forgot. And so look at this string of verses in Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Nehemiah 9 and verse 6. Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heavens of heavens. You see that sky out there? See those starry skies at night? God made all that. With all their host, all those stars call the host. The earth 
in all things that are therein, to the deepest oceans, the highest hills, the deserts, the plains, everything, the seas and all that is therein, and thou preservest them all. God made it all. God's maintaining it all. That's why it's still here. And the host of heaven worshipeth thee. Did you see the connection of thought? You acknowledge what God has done in his creation and preservation of it. And then the logical follow-up, he's worshipped. That's the reason to worship him. Look at Psalm 86, 8 through 10. The Psalms are particularly poems, hymns of worship. In Psalms 86, 8 through 10. Among the gods there is none like unto thee. The gods that are worshipped by the heathen, we call them the heathen, that do not worship the true, the only true and living God, their gods are nothing. Among the gods there is none like unto thee, O Lord, neither are there any works like unto thy works. Now, acknowledging these incomparable works of God, all nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship thee. See worship flowing out of that realization? Shall, come, shall worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. Now, why are they going to worship thee? For, here's the reason, thou art great, and his works make that very evident. Thou art great, and doest wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Then Psalm 95, 1 through 6, a call to worship. Psalm 95, O come, let us sing, Unto the Lord. That we did that this morning, didn't we? Weren't we singing to God? Weren't we addressing God? Didn't we open up and say, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And we address Him, all thy works, thy, that's addressing Him, shall praise thy name. We were talking to God in that song. And so let us sing unto the Lord, and let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Did not our brother Kevin come before God this morning and offer him thanks? And make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. Now why do we do all these acts of worship? For this reason, the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. A side note. The sea is his, and he made it. This is the 4th of July weekend. How many people in this country will visit the ocean side, will visit the sea, and enjoy the salt air, the waves, the water, the white sands, the warm breezes, but never go beyond that to realize that they're looking at something that belongs to God and that God made. They do not step beyond the enjoyment of the ocean to where it came from. That's one of the principal things we'll be driving home in this series of messages. Then come to Psalm 96. It's likely on the same page if your edition of the Bible is as mine. In verses 4 and 5. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For the gods of the nations are idols. And there's so many people in this world that fall down before statues, that worship statues, and pray to statues that men have made that are cap incapable of doing nothing. They can't even move unless their worshipers pick them up and move them. Our God is not like that. We don't move God. God moves us. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. But you see, just go back. This declaration that God is great and greatly to be praised arises from the fact that the Lord made the heavens. The works of God are the reason for the worship of God. 
Then it will take you to Revelation. Just a couple of more verses to drive home this fact that at the foundation of our worship is the recognition of the works of God. And this is, this is so fundamental to our holy religion. If you like basics, it's as basic as it gets, folks. In Revelation 4, John is allowed to see beyond this world, this apostle, and is actually let by God to see what's going on in heaven where we all hope to go when we die. The book of Revelation, there's another name for it. It is called the Apocalypse. Now, that's a fancy Greek word that simply means the unveiling. What you see in Revelation is, as it were, God pulls back a curtain in front of the Holy Apostle and lets him see into places we cannot see unless we are specifically shown, which I have never been, but I believe the report of the Holy Apostle. And so he's let to see what's going on in heaven. And we read in verses 9 through 11, and when those beasts, and, and, and these beasts, don't be tripped up by that. They're actually an order of angels that, have, that look like certain animals. And that's why they're called the beasts. But that's, that's not my subject. So I, I'm just saying that in passing in the event that somebody reads that and thinks, huh? And the bee, four beasts, where was I? In verse 9. And when those beasts give honor and give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne. In other words, they're thanking and honoring God who liveth forever and ever. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Why is God so worthy to receive all this glory, this worship? Here's the reason. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. God's work of creation is the reason for his worship. And then lastly, in Revelation 14, 6 through 7, will be my last verse. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. This is a message that belongs to everybody, addressed to everybody. There is not one soul in this room that I'm talking to that can claim exemption from this call. Saying with a loud voice, this is the responsibility of every man, woman, and child on the face of this earth. Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment is come and worship Him. But notice what is connected with this call to worship. Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. I will confess that perhaps that was an overkill, but maybe not. Just to show you that from the revelation God has made of Himself in this book, foundational to our responsibility to thank God, to worship God, is the fact of God's works, that He made this world. He's preserving this world. This world is running because of Him. And the more you contemplate the works of God for what they truly are, His works the more you will be motivated to worship and serve Him. Let me repeat that sentence. Because this is one of the most important sentences in this series. And this is a point I will come back to again and again. The more you contemplate, think about the works of God for what they truly are, His works, not just thinking about all this stuff, but thinking of it as his stuff, his sky, his sun, his ocean, his earth, his dog, his horse, his civilization, his world. The more you think of it like that, the more you will be motivated to worship and serve him because you will have looked beyond the works to the God that made them. And that's what the works are designed to do. Everything you enjoy in this world, 
from the goldfish in the bowl to the mountain you climb is pointing you to God if you are not blind and deaf to the message that is being proclaimed. Now going back to our psalm, and this is going to bring it down to those of you that are believers and servants of God. And so this will have a practical application in the outset. The psalm call opens with a call to praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Then there's this statement. I will praise the Lord. In other words, I'm going to answer the call. He said, praise him. I'm going to do it. I will praise the Lord, but notice, with my whole heart, and notice where I'm going to do it. In the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. So the psalm opens with a call to praise God and a resolution, a purpose, an intention, a decision to do precisely that. But observe that in following through with this resolution, it says, I'll do so with my whole heart. The God that made you and made me demands that you love Him, that you worship Him with your whole heart. When you do this, the whole of you needs to be involved in it. That you're really doing this from the innermost part of your being. That this is what you're all about. You really are dedicated to it. Uh, For example, and again, these are Bible verses addressed to Bible believers, telling Bible believers what they ought to do. But the question is, how do you address somebody that knows nothing about the Bible? They need to have some reason why they believe this is telling them what they should do. And we'll get there, okay? But like I say, we're following verse by verse. And as we do so, I have to deal with the things that talk to you. And then the information that you can take from this to talk to others that don't know what you know about your God and your Bible. But you need to make sure this is true of you. Because if this isn't true of you, it will weaken and water down the effectiveness of your witness. You understand that? It will weaken the effectiveness of your testimony if this does not describe you. And so we read in Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 and 13. And now Israel, this is a name for those who are God's people. A name that can be applied to this church from the New Testament. And now Israel, what does the Lord require of thee? What does the Lord require of you folks that claim to be his people? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to love him, to serve him. I'm at Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 12. To walk in his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God, and here's what I'm after, with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. And serving God and keeping his commandments is the good life. It is the best life a human being can live on this earth, and I could spend days advancing to you the reasons for that, but I shall defer to deal with the subject at hand. The point I'm after in that passage is God is calling you to do what you do in your service to Him with your whole heart. When my German friends were here last, I preached a bilingual sermon, as you may recall, addressing both in German, then translating into English. And when I got done with the sermon... I said in German, and I remember the tears in Helga's eyes. I said, what I am telling you now defines the deepest part of who I am. You may know me as somebody to have fun with, somebody that can speak your language so that we can talk about pretty well anything we want to. But if you really want to know me and the deepest part of what I am, It is to know my faith and what I am as a servant of God. Because you see, Israel that was commanded to put their whole heart into the business of their religion 
failed to do so. They served God with a divided heart. Oh yeah, they went through the motions, but there was something missing. They might have been sitting in church, but their affections and their hearts and desires were someone else, somewhere else. I can't get there fast enough when this is over because there's something else out there that vies for me with every bit as much or more potency than my yearning to honor my God. And so the complaint is made in the prophecy of Hosea chapter 10 and verse 2 to Israel. Their heart is divided and now they shall be found faulty. You see, God considers divided heart a faulty heart. In 2 Kings 18, or pardon me, 1 Kings 18, 21, this complaint was issued to Israel by the prophet Elijah. In 1 Kings 18, 21, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? You've got a divided heart. You can't make up your mind. You're vacillating back and forth. This is 1 Kings 18, 21. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, if this other thing you're worshiping, if Baal and follow him, and the people answered him not a word. In other words, make up your mind who you think God is, and whoever you think it is, follow him. That's the point. Make up your mind and follow whatever you think God is. But don't serve with a divided heart between the two. Now, when you consider, especially in our modern digital age, when you consider how many distractions there are in our modern culture that vie for our hearts and our attention, then we do well to pray this prayer to God that we find in Psalm 86. Psalm 86, 11 and 12. I was having a conversation with someone here just very recently. I think my wife and I were talking about this on yesterday evening. And that is that when I was a kid coming up, of course, we had television. I mean, I remember black and white before we even had color. I go way back, folks. And I remember when they started having Saturday night at the movies on the television. And they would have an old movie and they would show it on Saturday night. One channel, one time a week, one movie on Saturday night. Now they have channels where you can watch movies 24 Seven, and you don't even have to sit in your living room. You carry it in your pocket. All of these things that vie for our attention. Matt just finished reading a book that I recommended to him about the addictive nature of all of this digital technology with all the bells and whistles and vibrations and constantly distracting you so that your mind is not united and focused. That's not good. And so we do well to pray this prayer in Psalm chapter 86, verses 11 and 12. Teach me the, thy way, O Lord, and I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart. And that's why I selected the song that says, Call home thy thoughts that rove abroad. Unite my heart. Get my affections, my ambitions united. Get, it, get, get all of this into focus. Unite my heart. For what purpose? To fear thy name, which is another way of saying to worship thee, to acknowledge thee, to subject myself to thee. And with the united heart, then the resolve is made again. I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart all my heart, and I will glorify thy name for evermore. Now then, going back to our psalm, I'm kind of breaking it down for you. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart, but where am I going to do that? Well, 
That's why I'm going to the beach this weekend. So my family and I can praise God for the beautiful ocean. That's why we're going on a mountain hike this weekend. So we can praise God from the mountain tops. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that if you happen to be there. But that is no substitute for what is resolved in this passage. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. Where? In the assembly. You know what an assembly is? It's a gathering of people such as is in this room right now. In the assembly of the upright, which is another word to describe people that love God, fear God, and serve God. And in the congregation. This is one of the several examples we find in our Bible where the Bible defines its own terms. What is an assembly? It's a congregation. What is a congregation? It's an assembly. What is a church? You can compare verses and find out a church is a congregation. And then you can find out from this a congregation is an assembly. And that is why people that are members of the church are said not to forsake the assembling of themselves together. In other words, what this psalmist is saying is, I am going to go to church. To do what people in church do, and that is praise and worship God. But there's two critically important words that go into this resolution made by the psalmist. The words, I will. He's going to do this because he wills to do it. You see, if you would wholeheartedly praise God in the assembly as we are called here to do, it requires an exercise of your will. Praise must consist of more than just a wave of emotion. I mean, anybody can go to church and a lively song can be sung and they can feel an emotional rush from the lively music and say, oh, wow, we had a great worship service when really it was more based in the emotion than it was in the will. And you see emotions die down. Or have you noticed that? Have you noticed that? Emotions have a way of going up and down. We cycle in, we cycle out. There must be more behind the worship of God than, well, I'm going to do it today because I feel like it. <laughs> have you ever come to church when you didn't feel like it? I have. I've preached many a sermon when I didn't feel like doing it, but it was my calling under God, and so I will do even if I don't feel like it. You see, the will is foundational here. It is the truth of the matter that most people, most of the time, do what they want to do. The will is so fundamental in the deciding of our actions. The will, the act of the will will transcend the ups and downs of your emotions through all the changing circumstances of life. If you do not understand what I'm talking about with fluctuating emotions, try falling in love and getting married. And tell me if you always feel in love exactly like you did on that moonlit night when he proposed to me. <laughs> or where she prodded him to do it or whatever, you know. <laughs> You know the Hollywood version, it's the music in the background and you've got the tears in your eyes. It's, oh, this is so lovely. It does not stay that way. No, it doesn't. You wake up the next morning to headaches, stomach aches, back aches, belches, gas, you name it. I need not elaborate, but just to show you the emotions don't always stay at the same pitch. And so if you're going to make it in a marriage, it's got to go beyond the waves of emotion. It's got to go to the determination of the will. I made a commitment, and I'm going to stay true to it. God help me. The will determines where you go. It determines what you will do in your life. And this psalmist has exercised his will to say, I will praise the Lord. Now, that's some stuff for believers. Just give me a moment here. 
Let your brains air a bit. And then this next verse, I really, really am excited about what I can tell you in this next verse. The works of the Lord are great. The things God does, like making the heavens and the earth, wouldn't you say that's a pretty big deal? <laughs> to, for starters, the works of the Lord are great. But then this is a very important expression. Sought out, researched, studied, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. The fact that the works of the Lord are great is true of anything God does, regardless of the size of His work or the number of His work. The fact that there are billions of human hearts beating on this earth as yours is right now doesn't make the creation of the human heart any less great because there are so many of them. And whether you are talking about the furthest expanses of the universe, and that is great, or whether you are talking about the atom, that is also great. Think of the amount of power and energy that can be released by splitting the atom. You need go no further than something you cannot see with your naked eye to discern even there that his works are great. God's works are great. And we'll give you some examples of that as we move through to just drive that point home. But just suffice it to say that any of the works of God are great regardless of the size of them or the number of them. The greatness of God is concluded from the greatness of His works. His works are great. And so what do we extrapolate from that? Any being that can do works as great as that must himself be great. <laughs> Notice Psalm 145, and you shall see this conclusion drawn from the greatness of his works. I mean, all you have to do is go out and look on a starry night if you do not live in an urban area where you can't see the stars. If you live out in the country, in a rural area, where you can see the stars, the mac. The, the teeming innumerable numbers of the stars. I remember one of the best speeches that was made in this church was made years ago by Jim Wood when he and Kathy had moved out to a tiny little hole in the road. I don't even remember the name of the town, but if you blinked, you got right through it. And they lived out on an acreage and he made a speech about looking at the stars, at being able to see the stars, because in the cities, all the lights overpower our ability to see them. And he was just talking about the wonder, the majesty, the greatness of the stars. So if you look at all of that, and you say, God made this, this great universe, there's only one conclusion you can come to if you take it a step further, and that is God is great. He's a very great being. Uh, Psalm 145, 3 through 6. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. I mean, we ought to really put our best energies into this. Greatly to be praised, and His greatness is unsearchable. I mean, man has failed to explore the furthest reaches of the universe. They haven't even dug down to the very bottom end of being. You find something like a molecule, you go a little further, you find an atom, you go a little further, you find electrons, neutrons, protons, and something maybe underneath that. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another, which is exactly what I'm doing this morning. I'm one generation. I'm praising and magnifying the works of God to the generation of my children and the generation of my grandchildren. One generation to another. And this, believer, is your responsibility to make sure that you pass on to whatever generations come from you the acknowledgement of the greatness of God. One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. See the great things he's done. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works. And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and will declare 
thy greatness. Don't you see that from this passage that looking at the greatness of God's works, he ties that in with the fact that God himself is great. Then look at Psalm 107, 4 and 5. He telleth the number of the stars. It should not, it should not stagger your imagination or over challenge it to come to the conclusion that if God made every star out there, if he's big enough to do that, he's big enough to know how many there are. And that's exactly what he's telling us here. He telleth them. He numbers them and calleth them all by their names. Now, what do you extrapolate from a being like that? God is our Lord and of great power. And his understanding is infinite. Now, before I go any further, when I talk about the works of the Lord, let me sum up what I'm talking about. The works of the Lord would include His creation of all things, His preservation of His creation, the fact that it's still here ever since it was spoken into existence, the government of His creation, that God is running this world, His miracles, of which we have records in the Bible, the destruction of the wicked in time and eternity, and the salvation of his people in time and eternity, the destruction of the present creation at the end of, the ta- end of time, and the new creation that is to displace this one when this one is gone. These would, all of these things, fall under the heading <clears throat> of the works of the Lord. Now my next point. The works of the Lord are great and are sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. Living in the midst of the works of God as we do, being ourselves a work of God as we are, we are called to think about this. We are called to contemplate meditate on, think about his works. I will give you two verses in which God calls us to do this. In Job 37, Job 37 and verse 14, Hearken unto this, O Job. Stand still. Which being interpreted is, turn off the radio, turn off the television, turn off the phone, And just be still for a while and think. Let yourself think instead of your mind constantly distracted by bells, whistles, buzzes, and vibrations. Stand still and think. Consider the wondrous works of God. Or, or I don't know which one of the Bush boys it is, but let me say it like the preacher in England says it. Consider. (laughs) They, They imitate me. When I quote the British preacher that Larry and I heard in Luton, Bedfordshire back in 1979, and his text was, Consider your ways. And he preached about at that level. (laughs) He wasn't even that loud. Consider your ways. Anyway, but but he had a good point here. Except in this situation, we're not called to consider ours, we're called to consider his. Consider... The wondrous works of God. Stand still and think about it. We are called by God to contemplate. Then look at Isaiah 40. I love this. I love this verse. Notice carefully how it's worded. And you will understand that so many people, I would say the majority of people walking on the face of this earth, do not do this. Isaiah 40, 26. Lift up your eyes on high. Let me give all of you a piece of advice. From time to time when you're outside, instead of doing like so many I see, taking their walks in the complex, might I invite you instead to lift up your eyes from that rivet, being riveted on that addicting device and look up. Look at the cloud. Look at the blue skies. Take a glance at the sun and then blink your eyes. Look at the moon at night. Look at the stars. Look up. 
Lift up your eyes on high and behold. Now notice, I'm going to read it and leave something out. Behold these things, which is just what I told you to do, isn't it? And so look at all that stuff up there. But notice it didn't just say behold these things. It said behold who hath created these things. God is telling you when you look up at those things, you want to not just see those things. You want to see God revealed in those things as the source of them, as the creator of them. It pays to look up and ask the question, where did all this come from? And of course, the only logical answer is God. So when we are called to look up at these things, we are called to look up and discern God in these things. Lift up your eyes on high and behold, who hath created these things that bringeth out their host by number. The host is talking about all those stars that God brings out every night by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might. They've all got a name, whether you know it or not. doesn't matter. God knows. For that he is strong in power, not one faileth. Every single twinkling little star serves a purpose. God has put it there, and it does not fail to serve its purpose. I think it's amazing that here we are, thousands of years after, and I say thousands, not millions of billions. Now, that's a, that's a different argument also. This world is not billions of years old. Biblically, you can track it out, it's about 6,000 years old. But again, that is a different subject. Oh, but, but scientists say. <laughs> scientists say. No proof. No proof. They say it all came from a big bang. We say it was created by a God we do not see, but a God who is there. An invisible but very real being. Oh, well then you believe something that you haven't seen. That's just a belief. Well, you people that believe the world came from a big bang, did you see it? Did you hear it? Then you also believe. This world came from something you didn't see and didn't hear. See? So when you talk about the origin of the universe, either way you split it, folks, it's a faith. Now, which is the more rational faith? That all of this universe, with all of its intricate design and all the interplay of its mechanisms, such as we see in the human body, are just a result of a mindless cosmic accident? Or that an intelligent creator designed it to work that way. You tell me which takes the more faith. But that takes me afield. But we are called to contemplate God's works and in so doing to discover God. Because you see, as we seek out God's works, as we answer his call to look up and contemplate, we discover unless, unless our hearts are blinded, we discover Two things, that God is, and that he's great, and the logical conclusion from that, there is nothing too hard for him. Now let me show you this, the logical conclusion. We come to Romans chapter 1, one of the most philosophically sound statements ever made, which is one of the reasons I believe that the Bible is the word of God, because the Bible sets forth a sound rational, consistent philosophy that explains the being of things, how we know they're there, and what effect that should have upon us. In Romans 1.20 we read, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. You see, if you look at the world you live in and you reason it out, you're going to have to come back to it coming from something you didn't see. That's the invisible God. You're going to reason back to an infinite being as the source of it all. Now let me just pause and expound to you what I mean by that. Everything in the world is limited. Everything in the world has boundaries. And anything that has boundaries has a beginning. And if it has a beginning, something had to begin it. So as you reason through chain of cause and effect in this world, you're going to have to come back to some point where it all started, where it all had a beginning. Now, if it began itself, how's that possible? It would have had to be before itself. 
to begin it so. So ultimately, you have to come back to a being that began it, that himself has no beginning. Because if he has a beginning, then somebody began him. You follow? In other words, it's necessary to come back to a being that is boundless in being. He is infinite in time, in space, in knowledge, and in power. In other words, you come back to God. And that's what all of this creation is screaming to you, if you will listen to it. That God is there. He is the source of it all. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly, clearly seen. This is obvious. Unless I say you are mentally blind. Being understood by the things that are made. All you got is stuff. Look at the stuff he made. His works. And you're going to conclude from that that he is. Even being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power. That this is a God of limitless, infinite power. And Godhead, that he's there, there is God, so that they are without excuse. There is no human being with a rational mind that has any excuse for not believing in God. They have none. The evidence is there if they will but look and consider and think. And then understanding that he's made all of this, you understand from that he's obviously great, he obviously has great power, and therefore nothing is too hard for him. Jeremiah 32, 17 through 22 is another passage along this line. Jeremiah 32, begin at verse 17. Ah, oh, Lord God. See, he's awed by the thought of God. Ah, oh, Lord God! Exclamation point. He ever looked at God's work and said, Ah, oh, Lord God. That was really the way it affected me, though I didn't use that expression. When that instructor showed me that model of a human heart and how the human heart works, I was awestruck. And it took me directly from the machine of my heart to God. That's what it's supposed to do. That's where it's pointing. Ah, oh, Lord God. Behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm. Conclusion, there's nothing too hard for thee. Now, I will tell you something about the Bible in advance and just mention this in passing. There are records in your Bible of miracles, unusual occurrences that you don't ordinarily see. And there are plenty of people out there that deny the happening of miracles. They do not believe in the existence of miracles. The way to reason with a person like that is, do you believe in an almighty God that made heaven and earth? If they believe that, then it follows that if he could make a universe like this, he can perform a miracle. So really, at the basis of denying the miraculous as reported in the Bible, is a denial of the infinite power of God as manifest in the creation. It's as simple as that, people. As simple as that. And, of course, if they don't believe that Almighty God created in heaven and earth, then why even discuss miracles? Why even? That's pointless discussion. They, don't, they're not even, they haven't even gotten to base one. You can't get them to base three till you get them to base one. And now he says, Thou showest, look, verse 18, loving kindness unto thousands. And, and by the way, the young lady did not leave because she doesn't like the sermon. She has to go to work. So I just want you to know that. I didn't chase somebody out of here by what I was saying. I think she likes me. Yeah, she does. I've known her for years. Thou showest loving kindness unto thousands. And recompenses the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty God, the Lord of hosts is his name. Great in counsel, mighty in works. For thy eyes are open upon all the ways of the sons of men. You see, a God that made a universe like this and made everything in it is obviously a God that can see I mean, if you made the animals to see, if you made us to see, he obviously himself can see. 
And if He's great enough to make it all, He's great enough to see it all, which means every moment of your life, He's watching you and everything you do. And you say, ooh, that's scary. (laughs) You bet. Makes you think, I better know what this God expects of me. You know what you call that? Fearing God. Logical conclusion. All right, and then, and then he says, Thine eyes are open upon all the ways of the sons of men to give to everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings, which has set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt even unto this day. Now, he's talking about the historical event of the Israelites, his people being delivered from bondage and slavery in Egypt when he brought them through the Red Sea in the wilderness and took them into the promised land of Canaan in the Middle East. This is something he did mm, about 3,500 years ago, which has set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt even unto this day and in Israel and among other men. And it's made thee a name as at this day. That event of Israel coming out of Egypt has been celebrated for 3,500 years by the Jewish people in their Passover every year, which was a feast instituted at the time that they went out of Egypt. Uh, This this event has gained God so much renown in human history, they've made movies about it. There's even a cartoon version of it, remembering this marvelous work of God that made him a name. And it's brought forth thy people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and with wonders and with strong hand and with a stretched out arm and with great terror. God executed marvelous plagues to get the Egyptians to bend to let their slaves go. And it's given them this land which thou didst swear to their fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey. And right now as I speak That plot of real estate that God gave to those people of Israel by great signs and wonders and miraculous events that are recorded in their history and celebrated in their rituals. That plot of ground is being possessed by the people that claim to be the same people as they were and have a divine right to that piece of real estate and have their name slapped on it, the nation of Israel. Now, we could get into the doctrinal theological argument as to whether they have any legal right to that land or not, but that's beside the point. The point is there is a nation that wears that name that has an ancient history that goes all the way back to what Abraham is talking, uh, pardon me, Jeremiah is talking about right there, which is a standing, living testimony in our present time to the historical accuracy of the book we read called the Holy Bible. That's all I want to say about that right now. That's another subject. But now notice the works of God are sought out by all them that have pleasure therein. And, And I'm not going to get beyond this verse, but... All they that have pleasure therein. Stay with me, and I'll bring this to a conclusion. But bear in mind, we got a little bit of a late start because of the roaring air filters. Thank you, Nick, for getting to the bottom of that. God's works are sought out of all them that have pleasure in them. I want every one of you, and this I'm talking to you church members, as well as anybody else under my hearing, or in my hearing, ask yourself, Do you find pleasure in beholding what God has done? And does this prompt you to learn more about what God has done? Do you hear that? Does, do you find pleasure? God's works are sought out of all them that have pleasure in them. And so if you have people not seeking God's works out, that's because they don't find any delight in it. They may enjoy God's works, like the seaside or the mountains or the beasts. They might like their cow, as my daughter does, and the sweet little calf it had this week that I petted yesterday. I mean, they might find pleasure in these things that God has built and given us and done, but they find pleasure only in the thing as a thing in itself, not as a work of God. See the difference? See the difference? And so, God's works are sought out of them that have pleasure in them. Do you like to study the things you study in this world because you find pleasure in knowing that 
God did this. And God's written word, the Bible, is a record of his works, as just reading it will demonstrate. I mean, after all, the Bible opens up with God's work of creation. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It's a record of God's works. And so I would ask you, I would take it a step further, believer, do you find pleasure in God's written record of his works? Does it bring you pleasure? Do you find more pleasure in what God does or in what men do? Does the record, the written record of God's works bring you as much pleasure as the achievements of your favorite athlete? Or your favorite team? See, this you ask yourself. How much pleasure do I really derive from what God does? Do I even think of it that way? And in the written record of his works. How much pleasure does God's written record of his works bring you? If you derive pleasure seeking out God's works, then it follows you'll derive pleasure from the record of them. Now consider these verses, just a, just a few more verses, expressing the pleasure that one takes in the record of God's works. Psalm 1, 1 and 2. Now this is more directed to the believer, the Bible believer, but like I say, this sermon will have, or this series will have a, a twofold direction to those who believe the Bible and to those who are not yet convinced I would like to give you an argument to convince you. If you are convincible, if you really want to know. In Psalm 1, 1 and 2, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, where God's works are recorded, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Psalm 19, 10. Psalm 19, 10. More, talking about God's written scriptures, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Psalm 119, 14 through 16. Psalm 119, 14 through 16. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies. Can I substitute in the record of thy works as much as in all riches? I will meditate in thy precepts. I'll think about this record of thy works and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I'm really going to enjoy learning about what you've recorded of your works in the Bible. And I will not forget thy word. And you generally don't forget the things you most delight in. And lastly, Jeremiah 15:16. As I have been doing this series of Bible studies on Wednesday night, where we're doing a survey of the whole Bible, and I'm pointing out the interconnectedness of all the various books and the harmony, that although there are 66 books, they all cohere together to form one single volume with a central message. I cannot begin to tell you how rewarding this has been. Whether you get anything out of it or not, I've already tasted the honey and put the gold in the bank account of my knowledge and understanding. Indeed. And then in Jeremiah 15, 16, Thy words were found and I did eat them. They're like food to my soul. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. That's a person that seeks out God's works because he has pleasure in them. And you see, I, 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 let me just say this to you. Once you get into God's Word, the Scriptures, once you get into them and they get into you, you will enjoy them. If you don't enjoy them, you haven't really gotten into them enough to let them get into you. That's what it takes. Now, the sad thing, and I want to close now on this note. The sad thing is that most people seek out God's works. Every, most everybody does. But they do not seek them out as works of God, but just as stuff to be studied. 
How many, how many students are there in medical schools studying this marvelous machine, this marvelous creation called the human body, and never move beyond that to see it as a work of God? They're studying the work, but they don't study it for what it truly is, the work of God. How many geologists, astronomers, study these things? How many historians study history, but do not trace the hand of God in the movements of human history? They study the works as just stuff to be studied, but not for what they really are, as the works of God. And whatever pleasure they derive from their research, and they do, that pleasure does not terminate in God. God, the evidence of God, is staring them in the face as they study the stuff. But sadly, they do not see it. They do not stop to consider such questions as, why does anything exist in the first place? Why do things work the way they do? Why are we here? And where are we ultimately going? Why are you here? Why are you sitting there? Well, you might say it's because my mom and my dad fell in love and decided they wanted to have a family and have some kids and they did what it took to make it happen and it happened and, and that's why I'm here. Okay, yeah, that, that, that's a nice answer, but do you realize how, how short-sighted that is? Where did your parents come from? Why were they here? Well, for the same reason I'm here. But don't you realize, you've got to look for ultimate answers. Not just these immediate answers, but why is there such a thing as parenthood? Why is there such a thing as an attraction between two sexes? Why is there such a thing as two people falling in love? And why is it when they do what people do to make babies, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it works when they want to, and sometimes it works when they don't want it to? Hello? Hello? Where did all this come from? You see what I'm saying? The ultimate answer is not just an immediate answer, well, my parents wanted to have kids and that's why I'm here. You see... These are questions that dispose the mind to seek answers, but nature does not provide the ultimate answer to these questions. These are questions that can only be found, that can find only a rational answer, rather, in God and in His wills and purposes. And that is what this psalm is teaching us about.